Human beings are a religious animal, and in the absence of actual religion, we will begin to seek others, which is one of the reasons, to put it crudely, our society is so fucked up right now. My position is that I just don't think this is true. What do you want me to do here? You know, if we remove religion from our society, things go downhill. Okay, what do you want me to do? I, I don't think this is true. Do I, do I just sort of I just lie to my children? It's not that people shouldn't question religion, it's the, the denigration of religion, has that been beneficial? And that's where I started to lose my faith in atheism. Alex O'Connor, Cosmic Skeptic, welcome back. Right, before we talk about all the serious stuff we want to talk about, we wanted to sit you down and have a go at you, right? Because last time you were on the show, you talked about not eating meat. Yes. And you ruined our producer. That's right. He stopped eating meat. Yes. Right, we had to fire him. Mm. And he's not been the same since. We still employ him in a different capacity, but he can't be our producer anymore, basically. It's a real shame. I, re I remember that was when you were still filming out of the comedy club. Yes. yes. Um, it's, been, it's been quite a time since then. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah, I, I do occasionally. It, it's, it's a little bit awkward. Um, of course, I had to do a sort of big, serious YouTube moment of saying that I'd, I'd not just changed my mind, but changed my lifestyle. And I occasionally get people coming up to me. I was at a, a, a sort of club party rave type thing and someone came up to me held up their instagram uh on their phone and they went is this you and i went yeah and they went wow i'm vegan too and i i sort of had to in that moment usually when that happens these days i have to have this sort of conversation where i say well listen thank you so much <laughs> i really appreciate that you listen to listen to, to what i'm saying and that, it, that it's affected you but but you, you should know that I, I made this this announcement i'm not vegan anymore um but in that moment, I just sort of had to go. Yeah. You know, that, that, was, that was all I could. That was all I could muster. I really can't imagine you at a rave. <laughs> you'd, you'd, um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I. Do you keep your blazer on when you're at the <laughs> rave, Alex? You know, Chris always has a go at me for this. He always likes to tell the story of when I showed up for a boat party that he'd organised in a suit, because yeah. I'm sort of trying to live out the philosophy that there's no situation where you can't wear a jacket. Mm. Which I think is no, you're, you're going to rapidly yeah. discover that's not true. I woke up yeah. like this, you know. <laughs> I actually sleep with the bow tie on, but I sort of take it off. <laughs> you take it off. Camera, you you yeah. dress down for us. Yeah. But anyway, so you've uh, so you ruined our producer. Mm -hmm. He didn't eat meat for a while, right? It was it was tense. It was difficult. We, we've got him sorted out now. He's all right. He's got a girlfriend now. He makes him eat meat, so yeah. it's all good, right? However, you stopped eating meat. Mm. Uh, you started eating. You stopped eating meat, and then you started eating meat. Mm. Yes. I mean, look, it's a. Uh, it's one of the most sort of significant things that's happened in, in my in my channel's history, and it's a, it's an it's an awkward terrain to navigate because you want to be open and you want to 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 keep people sort of informed with what you're doing, but at the same time, I didn't want to become in any way like an anti-vegan type guy. There's a bit of a pipeline that sometimes occurs when somebody uh, isn't vegan anymore, especially if their entire thing has been veganism. Mm. You know, there, there's this perception amongst vegans that people like to cash in on it, and that suddenly you're you're going on, you know, you're going on trigonometry and talking about how you're no longer a vegan. And the last thing I wanted and want to do is that because I still think that factory farming, in particular, is perhaps the greatest moral emergency that we're facing. Everything that I've ever said about factory farming, I stand by, and I think yeah. it's still true. And I still think I, I know that I don't know if you still do this, but you like to ask your guests what people aren't talking about, but should be talking mm -hmm. about. And I still think that factory farming has to be the answer to that question. I mean, you've had some interesting answers to that. You know, people have, I, I actually really liked Peter Hitchens's answer about cars and how they've mm -hmm. come to dominate modern cities. That's fascinating because, you know, that's, that's something that people don't tend to notice. But something like factory farming generally doesn't even enter into the equation. If you ask people you know, the, the moral or political issues that they care about on the street, they'd name, they'd, they'd name 100 before they got to anything involving the plight of animals. Um, and that's because I guess it's, at the moment, at least seen as a strictly moral issue rather than a political one. Well, the thing is, I, I don't know that it is because I actually think it's a market problem that can be solved with the market. Like, in, I am as concerned about factory farming, probably not quite as, as much as you are, but I, am, I, I don't like it. I think it's wrong. Uh, and I, I tried to buy meat that isn't sourced in that way. In the UK, actually quite difficult. In America... It, not that difficult. You sure. can order stuff very, very easily from all sorts of different suppliers. But um, if I, I think if there was a company in this country that wanted to mass mass sell 
uh, grass-fed, organically bred, free-range, whatever meat. There'd be a big demand for it, and people would pay a lot more than they're paying in the supermarket for it. I think that's that's true of people who are in a position to pay more money. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's 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 certainly the case that people are moralized into spending more money in, in in a great many areas. It happens all the time with environmentally friendly goods, for example. People are happy to pay more, but if you can't afford, if you, if you don't have the money, if if you're struggling to eat any food, let alone you know quality sourced meat, then of course you're going to buy the the, the cheapest mm. thing in the supermarket. So. I, I understand that position, but I, I have to say that I've, I've grown a lot more convinced that the way to solve this problem has to be top-down regulation. I mean, it, it's all well and good saying we're going to you know, boycott animal products. And, you know, great, awesome, you know, boycott factory farming, why not? But you know, the, the, with, with, with I, I don't know, like veganism can grow, but meat consumption can grow at the same time. Like, it, it's great, like there are less people eating these products and buying these products than otherwise would be. But the industry is still massive, and it, I don't think it's going to go away just because people are making different purchasing decisions. That has a huge effect, but that, that can't be the only way to solve this problem, especially because if it's the case that people aren't going to be vegan, right? Because the, the vegan movement says the problem is just that we don't have enough people on board yet, and one day there's going to be a critical mass, and then suddenly everyone's going to be vegan, and we won't even need to worry about regulation of the animal you know, farming industry because it just won't exist anymore. I'm not so optimistic that that's the case. However, what that means, or I shouldn't say however, what that means is that we're going to need to solve the problem in another way. And I think that has to be top-down top regulation. I don't know how you feel about that, but I, I think well, that that's... Well, for, for France, I know you want to jump in, but mm -hmm. since we're on this, top-down regulation, you basically, you're going to make meat very, very expensive. That's what's going to happen. Perhaps. Yes. yes. Uh, I mean, It's not the, perhaps. Yes, you are. The, the, there may be ways to, that we can solve that problem through subsidies, but also maybe the, the, the answer is to say, yes, it's going to be more expensive and people are already eating too much in the way of animal products and just need to be eating less. I don't know. Yeah. That's when you start getting into sort of, you know, governmental yeah, tyranny, luck, telling people, luck, yeah. telling people what they're allowed to eat. But I don't think it's quite the same. You know, you have this image in your head of the government coming in and saying, you're not allowed to eat red meat. I think that is different in principle mm -hmm. to the government uh, introducing legislations based on moral principles about the treatment of animals and animal cruelty that make it such that some products are more expensive so people have to eat less. I understand that that feels like the government is coming along and saying you're not allowed to eat meat, but that's not what it's doing. It's saying, look, yeah, a, a, lot of the, a, a lot of the products that we consume in this country would be made a lot more cheaply if we just got rid of health and safety regulations in our factories, for example. Mm. They'd be so much cheaper, right? But the fact that the government is saying you know, your jacket is going to be more expensive if you buy it from a, from a UK source because the people working in those factories uh, are, are sort of beholden or the, or the people organising the workers are beholden to certain regulatory practices. That's not the government coming in and saying you're not allowed to, you know, wear a nice suit. It, it may be that the suit is more expensive and that's kind of the government's fault. But what the government's doing there is prioritising the well-being of workers over you know, uh, a cheap suit. And I suppose in this instance, what the government will be doing is prioritizing the well-being of animals over a cheap meal. That, uh, that is, as long as cheap meals are still available for those who need them, you know. I'm actually quite convinced by your argument purely because the British love animals so much and they care so desperately about their welfare that actually, I think, if someone came along to make that argument in a coherent fashion, I actually think a lot of people in this country would be okay with that. Yeah, well, people in this country love pets. Mm. To say that they love animals, I mean, I, I, I should be fair, most people maybe don't quite know what's going on in factory farmings, or, or they do, but they, they figure, well, someone's surely doing something about it. You know, it, it's, it's not exactly their fault, but I mean, for example, the RSPCA, I've, I've always talked about how I think the RSPCA will be looked back upon with sort of... Uh, Probably ridicule in, in the sense that you have a, a royal society for the protection of animals that's just like totally fine with some of the most abominable practices imaginable. That the the pig industry is the, is the worst. I think pigs get the worst of it. If you're a if you're a piglet that's that's too sick to be profitable, if you're not going to make any money, you know, if you're not going to make it into adulthood, then you're killed. And the way this is done, colloquially known as thumping, blunt force trauma. They're taken by their hind legs and they're smashed into the concrete in the skull until they die. There was a high, a high welfare farm, I think I know where, but I won't say just in case I get it wrong, um, that was discovered, a so-called high welfare farm, that was discovered to be thumping piglets to death by, by smashing their skulls against the cages that their own mothers were being kept in. Right? This is a horrible practice. Now, thumping as a practice 
is officially approved by the RSPCA as a way of euthanizing these pigs. Now, do you remember when Kurt Zuma, the West Ham footballer, mm -hmm. was yes. caught on Snapchat kicking his, I say caught, somebody posted a video of him kicking his cat across the... I think he actually uploaded it himself. Yeah, I think he might have done it. Yeah. An extraordinary um, event, but but also, you know, it's almost like he was doing a social experiment because <laughs> the RSPCA eventually confiscated that cat. The same RSPCA that's fine with taking piglets by the hind legs and smashing their skulls into the concrete because they're not going to make enough money. And if they were going to make enough money, would be killed most likely in a gas chamber, choking on their own breath. But you kick your cat across the kitchen and not only do you get a, a, a media furore, I, I think even the, even, even the mayor of London was on Good Morning Britain or something condemning Kurt Zuma. And well, the, the mayor RS of London virtue signaling, no. <laughs> Can you believe it? No. Can you believe it? Yeah. And the RSPCA took away the, took away the cat. The same RSPCA that's totally fine with I, look. I, I just think that there is, shall we say, an element of cognitive dissonance. Yeah, I actually liked it. Uh, the couple of days later, I think when they played, when uh, West Ham played Watford, someone kicked him particularly hard, and he fell on the floor screaming. And the entire stadium started singing. Now you know how your cat feels. That's quite right. And I wonder how that stadium would feel if, um, if they saw any human being in front of them go through what the the animals go through. That they. Uh, they kill to, to eat their food, you know. Um, it would it would look like a horror show. But it's funny, isn't it? Because you know, mm. the, the the you know they they were, yeah. The, the the chants were quite funny, but they were also a little bit. Um, I don't know. It, it, it's cause for reflection mm -hmm. because if I saw somebody leaving that stadium who got mugged, somebody came up to them and slashed their throat open, watched them bleed out on the concrete, so that they could you know steal a little bit of their money for some added convenience getting home. And I started chanting at them, you know, now you know how your how <laughs> pal feels. I don't think it would be looked upon with such um, comedic effect. But that is an experiment I would like to see. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Well, pe people do this all the time. People do these kinds of uh, these kinds of social experiments where they, they mimic animal conditions on humans mm. and, and they do it in shop windows. And I, I sort of have a, 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 a strange relationship with these things. You know, you, you see people walking in supermarkets and throwing fake blood all over the place and mm. It's hard to know. I think the question there is whether they're just effective or not. But a lot of people just think they're sort of stupid or immoral or disruptive or whatever. But but that this is a, a, an accurate representation of, of of what we're doing to animals. I mean, and people people say, you know, well, like, of course, yeah, no, I, I I'm against animal cruelty. I I, I care about animal welfare. I try mm -hmm. to buy. But it's like I don't think we understand just how just how unimaginable the suffering is and how unfathomable the numbers are. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's, it's amazing. I mean, we, we, we kill millions of fish every minute. Mm. Millions. I mean, not to mention the environmental effects. I mean, the, 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 whole, the whole industry just needs a, a complete shake-up, and that's not the kind of thing that can happen by just people you know, refusing to buy a particular kind of product. I don't think that that's the only way this is going to happen. It's got to be governmental regulation. And also, veganism simply isn't sustainable for the vast majority of people. It's going to sound like a hack joke. It's rare I meet a vegan who looks well. Yeah, you, you do look a lot better, Alex, you, I have you, to say. You've, you, you've got flushed cheeks, your yeah. eyes are sparkling. You're nice and pink, you're going full gammon. Yep. That's just because that's just I'm blushing because you're being so nice. <laughs> I, I think, um, look, I, 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 I can't speak to this. I, I've seen many vegans who look healthy. I've seen many vegans that look unhealthy. I've seen mm. many non-vegans who look very unhealthy. You know, it, it, it's certainly harder, mm -hmm. and I don't doubt that it's possible to to be healthy on a vegan diet if you do it properly. Uh, the fact of the matter is that if you don't eat, uh, I, I won't say a perfect, but you know, an optimal diet, then if you're eating animal products, if you're not eating an optimal diet, you know, you're going to have some problems. If you're eating a vegan diet and you're not eating an optimal diet, you're going to have some problems. You're just probably going to have more problems. And so I can understand why that might be the case. I mean, if, if it were proved, for example, if you could show me a study that showed actually, yes, like the, the, let's say the majority of people with nutritional deficiencies were vegan. I don't think that's true, but let's say it were true. My answer to that would not be to say that's because veganism is unhealthy, but because being healthy as a vegan is harder than being healthy as a non-vegan. And that's something I said, you know, since 2019 or whenever it was. Do you think veganism in certain instances when you see it uh, at the way that it manifests within certain sections of society. Do you think it's almost akin to a religion? Well, uh, people say this about all kinds of things. They say it about wokeism. They, they say it about um, like a a anything that becomes a, a philosophy that people care about, mm -hmm. let's say. Um, no, but people mean something else too. 
or on all the well, examples you, you you've me, given. What, what, what well, you what they what they mean it when people say that wokeness is a religion or that I, yeah. I I've never heard anyone say veganism is a religion. I certainly wouldn't argue that. Mm. However, what people mean is that it is a set of beliefs that is an, that it causes people to behave in a way that is impractical and irrational, mm. and they do it in the service of an idea. Uh, that has almost mythical power over them. What I would say is a religion is the the, the doomerism of climate change. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely it has every element of religion, um, including people acting irrationally. I, I know I know I know what you mean. But would you say, for example, that um, I mean you've probably had people on the show talking about the threats of artificial intelligence. Yes. Yes. And how there's potentially sort of calamitous world-ending yes. implications. Mm. Would you call that a religion? Uh, I wouldn't call that a religion because they don't behave in, in the same way about it. They're not going out and throwing soup on things. We, we, we say that, but then I don't think there's, like, if people start taking seriously the idea that we seriously need to slow down or stop artificial intelligence. Look, 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 at, the, look at the environmental movement where, where you know, people start raising awareness that climate change is a thing. Mm -hmm. And then you know, a decade, a couple of decades later, people start taking it very seriously and start protesting in the streets. And then the arguments are sort of like, well, look, I, I get what you're saying. It's probably right, but your methods aren't effective. And, you know, what about China? Why, why should I care about what we're doing? Right. The same thing can happen here with artificial intelligence. It's already happening when people say, hey, let's just slow down. Let's put a pause on this technology. And people are saying, what, you think that other countries are going to put a pause on this? No, there, there's nothing we can do, right? And it's also apocalyptic. You know, the world's going to end. It's like all of the elements that you're identifying is potentially religious here based on this, this I mean, you call it mythical, but... It's always grounded in some kind of reality, right? Like the, the climate change stuff is grounded in the science. The veganism stuff is grounded in the very real animal cruelty. Mm -hmm. The artificial intelligence stuff is grounded in the actual you know, technology of, of AI. But it's still, you know, I could describe it as an apocalyptic death cult. And I could say that the effective altruists are saying that we should stop taking money that we're currently giving to try and, you know, fix malaria and buy malaria nets. We should be taking that money away from that kind of suffering and investing it into AI safety because that's a more important issue long term. If they're, if they're correct, then, then maybe that is what we should be doing. But it seems ludicrous and irrational to stop giving money to people in need to try and lift people out of poverty. Well, we haven't had yeah. anyone like that on so the that show. So that we can build better computers. But people are doing that, right? And so I could point to people like that and say, see, this AI thing, it's just an, uh, it's an apocalyptic death cult. And I feel like that's kind of what people do when they point to veganism, wokeism, environmentalism, and say it's a religion. No, I disagree. And here's why. I think the reason I disagree is people who are warning about AI, the, the people who are at the forefront of that, the people who are mm. uh, being talked up as the, the warning necessarily about these issues, they're people who are otherwise sensible and who are advocating fairly sensible things like, this is a new technology, we don't know how powerful it's gonna be, let's slow it down, let's make sure that we're not uh, overusing it, let's make sure it's, it's regulated, etc. Right, uh, the people uh, who are advocating on, on the environmental issue, for example, they're people who are demanding that we essentially suicide our, our economies, uh, to to in order, by the way, to make very very little impact on the problem. There's a very big difference between those two things. So uh, it's kind of like um, it, people say this about the BBC. People say, well, the BBC, you know, you've got left wing critics and right wing critics. Therefore, the BBC is in the middle. And by the way, some departments are in the middle. But actually, if you look at who the critics are who say it's too left wing versus too right wing is a very different picture. The mainstream center right thinks the BBC is incredibly left wing. The people who thinks who think the BBC is right wing are people on the very, very extremes of the left. So just because people are criticizing an issue or there's that parallel doesn't mean it's the same thing. Uh, and I think AI is not the best example for those uh, reasons. And also as well, one of the core components of any religion is a moral framework. So if you look at wokeism, for example, that has a very clear delineated moral framework, which the AI example doesn't, in my opinion. Yes, I, I, I think I, I see what you're saying and, and will agree with elements as, as you do with any conversation like this. The Galaxy Projector 2.0 is brilliant. I've got one at home and I can tell you my toddler absolutely loves it. If you're in need of a simple plan to get your little ones to settle down at night, then I recommend you try the Galaxy Projector 2.0. Kids love it, but the Galaxy Projector is for everyone. The device works great as a way to add some magic to your home lighting. I've seen people use it for immersive game room lighting, a home cinema, and for a house party too. It projects colorful nebulae and stars on your walls, ceilings, and pretty much any surface. 
giving any room a truly magical atmosphere. With its app, you have full control over the features, colors, brightness, on-off scheduling, and a lot more. Plus, if you have Amazon Alexa or Google Assistant, you can control it with those simply by saying the magic words. For you die-hard Trigonometry fans, you can get 15% off using the code TRIGGER when you buy a Galaxy Projector 2.0 at galaxylamps.co slash trigger. You can also follow the link in the description or scan the QR code below. And now, back to the interview. The, the idea that the people at the forefront, you know, um, are not going a bit crazy. I would say j just wait. I mean, you, well, Elon Musk is not Greta Thunberg, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Sure, but but you understand that, like, I, I I don't know where you consider yourself politically. I know that you were named in the New Statesman's list of you know the top fifty most powerful conservatives. Congratulations! <laughs> Forty six, four, four positions above the former prime minister Liz Truss. <laughs> yeah, do you know, it, it's funny. imagine how high up I would be if I were actually yeah. a conservative. Uh, when you were on my when you were on my show and I asked you about being a conservative and I I, I posted that clip when that was announced because mm. there was this clip of you saying I'm not a conservative. Yeah. And when I when I gave the context that the New Statesman had labelled you as, as the forty six most most powerful conservative. I didn't mean for that to, to cause this, but people were sort of, they, they began attacking the New Statesman saying, you know, oh, the New Statesman, they're, they're lying about Constantine, they're attacking him as a conservative. I, 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 don't, I don't think they were doing that. I think they, they just genuinely saw you that way. But mm. what I was going to say is, you know, suppose you are a conservative. Um, you're going to look at Greta Thunberg and think, you know, she's insane, she's crazy, she's, you know, absolutely mental. Okay, fine, right? If, if you're on the left, you might look at her and say, well, look, sometimes I, I, I think that she says something a bit silly, but she's not like crazy like they're making her out to be. Compa now, you compared her to Elon Musk a second ago. Look at what left wingers say about Elon Musk all the time. Look at, the, look at the way they describe him. Look at how they say that he's one of the most dangerous people on planet Earth, that he's insane, that he's immoral, that he's evil. I would wager that you don't agree with that. But clearly, this is being thrown at it, like in both directions, No, but right? Alex, this is the point that I think we're disagreeing over. The fact that people say the same thing about different people is not necessarily a reflection of the fact that those people are equivalent. Of course. Right? That just, you have to look at who it is that is saying it and why they're saying it. I, my, uh, what I say about Greta Thunberg is not based on some kind of uh, personal antipathy towards her. It's based on the fact that what she's advocating for is impractical and irrational and would be very damaging to the very people on whose behalf she's advocating. Yes. Right. What people say about Elon Musk is essentially a guy who's not one of us has taken over one of the means of communication and we don't like it. That's, I, that's I, a big difference. I, I would say, uh, and I suppose the only point I'm making here is that if you were speaking to somebody who was like a Greta fan and somebody who hated Elon Musk, if they yeah. were sat in this chair and yeah. they were able to articulate oh, it. Oh, what would they say? That's interesting. Well, I don't, I don't know what they would say because I'm not really in that position, but mm. they would probably say something like what you've just said. They'd say, well, but what, they'd, what is they'd, it? Say, they'd say, you know, my dislike for Elon Musk is, is not some, I, I, I don't think, what you, I don't think he's just like, oh, it's because he's not one of us because he's this billionaire and I just hate people like that. No, it's based on the things that he does. It's based like on what? his Twitter post. Like, I don't know. I'm well, no, this is the, but you have to say this other bit. Otherwise, this conversation doesn't make any sense. What is the rational critique of Elon Musk? And I can give you one. It's just not going to be the the one from these people. Sure. Well, maybe Elon Musk is the wrong example for me to be talking about. Okay, give, I, a, give another example. Oh, is it potentially with Musk? What they would say is that his views aren't consistent and they're dishonest because he claims to be in favor of freedom of speech, yes. but then he bans the account. But that isn't their critique, though. That just that isn't their critique. That but is, that, that, a, that's a critique that I can give and you can give and yeah. Alice can give because we recognize he's, you know, nope. But this is what I said, free speech absolutism doesn't exist. Nobody mm. who says they're free speech, free speech absolutism is something you can maintain when you're sitting in your basement. Yeah. Or your mother's basement, more likely, mm -hmm. right? Once you get into the real world and you start to have to make decisions about how to administer content on a platform, free speech absolutism is impossible. So that's a valid critique. He's not consistent. But that is not what the equivalent of the Greta critics might be saying about Elon, right? Why, so let's let's have another example because this is an interesting point you're but making. That's, that's also that's also not equivalent to what the the critics of Greta often because you you sit there in the chair and say, well, I think I, I don't like what Greta's saying because I think that what she's saying is you know fundamentally um, uh, self destructive or something yes. like that, right? Mm -hmm. But surely you you know that there are people who do just say she's an annoying teenager. Why would oh she's to a definitely kid? that too? You know yeah. this this kind like. But she is that too. It, it, it doesn't matter where you look, right? Like, like you're, you're going to get both. You're going to have people looking at Elon Musk and saying, I think that 
he claims to be pro free speech, but he's banning people on Twitter, and this is this is sort of. Uh, going to have a, a knock-on negative effect onto the, the sort of cultural social media, right? And then you're also going to get people who say he's a billionaire asshole, right? And the same thing's going to happen with Greta Thunberg. No, no, but my point is the people who are making the critique that Francis just made are not on the left. It's more people like us who are in the heterodox center or whatever who are going to go, what, because the right will love him for, you know, opening up the Overton window, or whatever. But people who are objective will say, look, I think it's, I think it's incredible that he's bought Twitter just because... It's the one place where there's less censorship now, and that, that means everyone else, there's no point for them censoring on Facebook and elsewhere because you're still going to get the information from Twitter. Mm -hmm. So I think it's great. But the critique still applies, which is he claimed he was a free speech absolutist. I just think it was a mistake. <coughs> Sorry, Elon wants me assassinated. Mm -hmm. um, I just think it was a mistake to do so. It's an interesting example because free speech has kind of become a bit of a right wing issue, which, yes. which kind of complicates this particular mm -hmm. example. Yes. But do, I mean, do, do you think that there, are, there aren't any left-wing critiques of Elon Musk to be taken seriously? Uh, you give me one and we can talk about it. I mean, well, again, th this um, Elon Musk is probably the right... I, I can't remember who <laughs> okay, first mentioned let's, him. Let's but, pick a different but, person. But, yeah. whatever they, but, but, but before we do as well, I, because we were talking about this in the context of the AI thing, and, and you were saying yes. um, you know, people aren't, as Greta is in your view, going out and telling people to do things which are essentially suicidal. Yes. Wait until artificial intelligence becomes, as it's already becoming, integral to our sort of workforce and economy mm -hmm. and wait until while that's the case people begin to take really seriously the idea that it's incredibly dangerous and start saying we need to put an end to this and people start protesting in the streets it's it's coming down the road and when that yep. happens what are people going to say they're going to point to the protesters of artificial intelligence and they're saying they're essentially telling us to suicide our own society and i'll, I'll be one of them because it will destroy our economy and i'll right? be one of the people making that critique and that's why i think although you might be right that right now they're disanalogous because people aren't doing that yet. Yeah. I don't think we're far off that. Okay, fine. So at some point, you believe it will become cultish or religious in nature, certainly according to the definition that Francis gave. To the yeah. same extent that you would, because we began, you were asking about whether veganism is yes. a exactly. religion. I think if yes, then only to the same extent that something like, in more obvious cases, environmentalism, wokeism, you know, but also... Uh, uh, because ev you know, especially I think listeners to the show will, will happily think, yeah, that's a bit religious. But when you think about something like AI, you think it'd be really weird to call that like a religion. But you can see how just having a sort of moral position on an important issue and it becoming basically the focal point of, of, your, of your campaigning can very easily be described in religious terms. No, but to me, see, this is the difference, though, because your moral position is one thing. It's, it's what you then do on, uh, based on your moral position. Sure. I might think, I'm not saying I do think this, but hypothetically speaking, I might think, I don't know, sex before marriage is wrong, right? But he would never, I, I'm not going to be in your bedroom going, no, 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 no. Like, I, my moral position is for me. Do you see what I mean? Yes, but that, that's... That it takes a religious element to be like, you need to do this. Not always. Not right? always, because, but because, it can Because be. look, like... The, the thing about sex before marriage and the reason it's such an easy argument to make is because there's no victim involved, right? That's completely untrue. Yeah. Completely untrue. B where's the victim in... in, in... Look at our society. Well, okay, okay. You've got, maybe, maybe you've like, got maybe like half children, the children right? in children. this okay. country. Okay. Go, no, Fair hold enough. on. No, no, there's, it's important. Half the children in this country grow up without, without a stable two-parent family, right? Why do you think all the social disease that we have, dis-ease, is the consequence of that? So the victim is not just the child involved, or by the way, the people themselves. It's also potentially the entire society and someone getting stabbed 20 years later once that kid's grown up without yes. a father is also the victim. Yes, right? no, I, I think I, so I, I... there is a victim. I, I misspoke when I put it too, yeah. too simply. You're, you're, you're quite right. But the point that I'm trying to make is that there are certain instances where, let's say, the harm is so immediate and obviously uh, and, and obviously sort of directly caused, because the, the longer the causal, causal chain gets, the more difficult it is to, to, to place, let's say, specific blame. So, for example, um, I don't know, if, if you have a, a moral antipathy towards abortion, mm -hmm. let's say you, you're, you're pro-life because you think that, you know, we shouldn't be able to kill human beings in the womb. Mm -hmm. Now, I could say to you, as... as Pro-choice activists do all the time. They say, well, hey, if you don't like abortions, don't get one, you know, stay out of my body. Mm -hmm. And what do the pro-life activists say? They say, look, I totally understand the intuition that you've got of sort of like, well, my morals are for me and I can't force them on you. But because the moral position that you're holding is killing another human being as they see it, that, 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 
justification just doesn't fly and shows that you're not actually understanding a word of what I'm saying about the importance of the issue. Mm -hmm. The same is, th this happens all the time in the vegan debate when people say, look, you know, I don't tell you not to eat your, your, your lettuce, so you can't come and tell me not to eat my, my hamburger. And, and it's like, do you really not see why that's different? Do you really not see why eating lettuce doesn't have a victim but eating a hamburger does. And you could say, well, actually eating lettuce does have a victim because it means that maybe you're going to be nutritionally deficient, which means that, you know, you're going to perform worse at your job and then your kids are going to have mm. less money and go to worse school. Like, yeah, but that's, that's, that's true, but it's far less direct. Yeah. And when you have a situation where somebody is, is quite obviously causing direct harm or risk of direct harm to somebody, then somebody stepping in and saying, you're not allowed to do this, I think everybody intuitively knows it's justified. And, and, and the, the, the sort of line of like, well, I have this moral view but I'm not going to sort of step into your world and, and enforce that uh, upon you. Well, the moment that there's a direct victim, I think that you'll do so, and you'll do so with with an, in, an, an intuitive force of how obviously correct that is. You know? but, the, but the problem is, Alex, is when you start looking for victims, you're going to find victims everywhere. So you look That's at true. the lettuce farmer, and then you're looking at the effect that their farm is having on the environment, the use of pesticides, the killing of birds, the killing, how it's absolutely decimating the local ecology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you could argue, you could make a pretty coherent argument that actually maybe the lettuce farm is doing far more damage than the cattle farm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you you always can. I mean, I, I'm not sure. Keep if, your hands off my lettuce. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure if that quite works with, with the lettuce thing. I mean, the, the, there's always that 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 bit that. Or that, avocados but, or whatever. But, 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 but sure, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm I, I'm the reason I'm speaking carefully here is because I know when people are listening and they hear somebody say because you know Joe Rogan says this occasionally. So one of his guests say, you know, well, if 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 you don't want to harm, if you if you want to harm the most animals, then then be vegan because mm -hmm. think of all the the animals that are getting died and be, and vegans just cringe because that that's sort of so not true, um, at least in the case of, of factory farming. But that granted, for you know the people at home, as it were, mm -hmm. um, sure, yeah, maybe maybe that causes more harm, yeah. But I mean, I, I can't remember why we got, I can't remember what issue it was you were we talking about. We started on religion, and actually, I think we should probably yeah. move on to religion because what you asked was a question about religion and veganism. But actually, what I think we're dancing around is something we wanted to talk about yeah, sure. anyway, which is, I think we both have had Richard Dawkins on the show. Yes. And one of the... Uh, threads of conversation, particularly in this space that we all kind of semi-inhabit with from different sides with different feet, etc., is essentially that um, while some people can be new atheists and have a great life, and Richard Dawkins is clearly someone, you know, who enjoys his life and is not devoid of meaning and blah, 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 blah. Human beings are a religious animal, and in the absence of actual religion, we will begin to seek others, which is one of the reasons, to put it crudely, our society is so fucked up right now. Hmm. The death of God is why we are where we are, and it's all your and Richard's fault. Yeah, maybe it is. Um, I mean, look, there, there's some compelling evidence to show that uh, religious communities, like I saw a study recently that, that religious communities coped better with the COVID pandemic, for example. Mm -hmm. And... There's evidence to show that people feel more fulfilled. Um, I think I think even like in their sex life, if they're religious, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's there's so many reasons why why there might be utility in in being religious. And and I suppose my answer to that is to say, well, of course, because if I don't believe that this is true, I have to account for why it exists. It wouldn't make, if you've got this thing that isn't true and is unambiguously harmful for society, then why the hell would it evolve? Mm -hmm. Of course, it must be doing something, right? And, and of course, the corollary of that is that by murdering God, um, yeah, we, we sort of, you know, the, the, the streets are covered in blood and um, people are sort of trying to erect false idols out of the DNA and they end up with, you know, as you would probably see it, wokeism, as some would see it, you know, Christian nationalism. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, not Christian nationalism because that's a form of religion, but, but nationalism, mm -hmm. let's say secular nationalism. Um, and that's true. Yeah, uh, uh, of course, that's the case. Human beings seek transcendence, they seek the divine. My position is that I just don't think this is true. And I don't have much more to say on this apart from asking, what do you want me to do here? And uh, I'm not exactly asking you, because mm. I, I don't yeah. think either of you are religious, I'm not sure, maybe you're agnostic or Christian, yeah. I, I don't know, but somebody says, well, look, you know, if we remove religion from our society, things go downhill. Okay, what do you want me to do? I, I don't think this is true, do I, do I just sort of, I just lie to my children. I just bring them up 
to believe something that I don't think is the case because I think it's going to be beneficial for society. Like maybe, but what does that look like? You know, and, and, and people say, well, why don't you just sort of act as if you're religious? You know, um, and Jordan Peterson says that people do this all the time. I don't think that's true. I think, sure, you can act like you're religious to the, in the sense that you can go to church on Christmas. Um, cool. You can sort of, I don't know, t take part in your, in your local religious community affairs and stuff. But when it comes to actually having to make an essentially religious sacrifice, like a real sacrifice, if you have to sort of put your life on the line for essentially a religious principle, Let's say you were just sort of pretending to be a Christian, you're just acting like a Christian, and suddenly there's a, there's a political invasion, a different religion sort of is taking over the country, and they come to you, they hold a gun to your head, and they say, say that Jesus is not God or I'll shoot you. In that moment, you're not going to pretend to be a Christian for the social utility. You're just going to throw it out immediately. Yeah, but that's right? not what people mean when they say act like you're a Christian. I don't think going to church is actually what they mean either. What they mean, so for example, we hear every time we have a meal here at the studio, we say grace, mm. right? No, I don't think anyone here is religious. Well, no one who eats here mm. is religious. Um, the woman editing this is religious, mm. so she's mm -hmm. upset with all three of us. Mm -hmm. Now, um, so what I think they mean is there are certain practices uh, around religion that will make your life better. Yes. And I think that's definitely true. Uh, the, the constant practicing of gratitude, the appreciation of the fact that you're not the center of the universe, the connection with the transcendent or the divine, the, the recognition that other people are as equal and equally important in the world as you are, uh, the serving of others, all of these things are practices that most religions have developed in one way or another that a secular person is unlikely to, to get themselves into because they're not natural to human beings. It's not natural to put other people ahead of yourself. It's not natural um, to practice gratitude. Most people, particularly in our society, don't, right? So I think what people mean when they say act as if you are religious is adopt some of the, the kind of the best things about religion. And it is an interim answer, by the way, because you mentioned children. Once you have children, it becomes very difficult. It's hard to explain to a five-year-old why they should do something without, you know, the bearded man mm -hmm. in the sky, which yes. I know religious people will get upset with me about because it's an unfair character, but I use it exactly for that purpose. Yeah. Uh, not, not to mention talking about things like death. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't have children. I know that you do. If, 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 if you think, as you seem to be implying, being religious might have some societal benefit mm. and some personal benefit mm. and that being an atheist might lead to being, you know, more self-serving and, and, and less sacrificial and this kind of thing. I mean, are, are you going to raise your child as a theist? Are you, you going to teach them that God exists? Are you going to take them to Sunday school? I don't think I'm going to teach them either, actually. Uh, I think I'm going to... I'm going to let them discover their own way of relating to that thing that does exist. Whether it, it's not that it's God that exists, but there is a there is a connection that binds all people, all human beings together in some way, and we all feel it. Uh, and the spiritual within us is part of that. Now, do you code that as the bearded man in the sky caricature, or do you code that as spirituality or whatever? Is up to you. But that thing exists. There's no there's no pretending otherwise. But then, notice that's essentially what secular society does on a societal level. It, a secular society is not like an atheist society. It's, it's not like, um, it's not like, like sort of communist Russia that's actively persecuting religious ideology. It, it just says, hands off. We say, look, I'm just going to leave it up to you. You can explore this religion, that religion. You know, we just hope that there's some kind of unifying spirit that we're all just going to come together and, and get along even though we're all exploring our own ideas. And that's the thing that people are pointing to it and are saying it's disastrous. No, 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 no. no. Need, They're pointing need... to Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins and all, all these other people who continually uh, attacked religion as, as a thing that should exist, right? Mm -hmm. God is not gray and all of this other stuff, the Hitchens book and et cetera. They were people who, this is my issue with, with new atheists and it's when I lost interest. I wrote a whole thing about it called The Atheist Delusion on my Substack. Yes. It's not that people shouldn't question religion. It's the, the denigration of religion. Has that been beneficial? And that's where I started to lose my faith in, in, in atheism. Mm. The other thing that ties in with the new atheist movement, which I think a lot of people forget, is it, was, it also came about because of the excesses of the church and the Roman Catholic Church and the way that it covered up abuses. And so when people were criticizing religion at that time, that was still very fresh in the mind. 
But the power of the church, and especially the Catholic church, has, has been utterly decimated. So they, they have gone from being this institution with, which had real power to being something that most of us don't really think about. That's true. Um, I mean, new atheism is traditionally thought of as springing up in the wake of 9-11. Hmm. Um, and, and you can you can imagine. I mean, it's it's difficult to imagine. I I, I can't remember a time before 9-11. Um, the Your idea poor, of... Poor child. The, the idea, the <laughs> it idea was such of, a great time. It was. <laughs> such a great... 9-11 was such a before. great time. It was. 9-11. Before. It was a, oh, yeah, Mate, the I, 90s I, were I, I sort of can't... I some, anytime I'm in, an, uh, I'm in an airport... I mean, I obviously didn't experience it, but I tried mm. to think of what it must have been like. I mean, I, I can't... I mean, get, going, getting on a plane without sort of, you know, being being thoroughly having my, my civil liberties just like frisked mm. on the spot. I, I, it would feel unnatural to me. Um, Mate, you used to be able to smoke on a plane. I, even within my lifetime, I, I, I used yeah. to smoke on a plane. I remember this. I don't smoke anymore, but it was still great. And when I was a kid, I remember flying. I mean, admittedly, this was the Soviet Union, so it was a different <laughs> environment. But flying from Uzbekistan to Moscow, um, there were no seats left on the plane. So they were like, oh, yeah, just come in the, in the, in the cockpit. Yeah. yeah, that's what it was like. Yeah, yeah. you can, you still can smoke on a plane, of course. You'll just be um, punished for it. But it's nice to remind oneself that there is still the freedom to, mm. to do as you please. If you're an atheist, after all, you know. Every, anyway, every you're talking about everything is new atheism post 9 um, I don't remember a time. The thing that I the thing that I can't imagine is people not really knowing anything about Islam. Mm -hmm. People not that not being really part of the political conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, there's like the Muslim world over there, and there are Muslims living among us, and maybe there's a bit of sort of cultural antipathy or whatever. But now it's like huge political issue. I can't imagine that not being the case. And you can imagine why an event like this instantly thrusts it into the, na the national conversation mm -hmm. because people want to say this isn't what Islam is about, and other people want to say this is, you know, what, what Islam will allow. And it becomes this huge political conversation. So you can see why a book like God is Not Great is going to be extraordinarily successful in that moment. And that's, what, that's the new in new atheism. I mean, there's nothing new about atheism, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, I mean, okay, so it's, it's like, it's a moment. And that moment arguably has passed. The Catholic Church isn't probably like a seriously, I mean, it's still a seriously powerful organization, but like its cultural power in the UK, for example, is, is basically yeah. next to nothing. People complain about bishops having reserved seats in the House of Lords. That is a bit weird. That's probably not great. You know, why do we reserve seats in our parliament for bishops of the Church of England? But does it really matter? Like really? Does it matter more than the fact that there are still any hereditary peers in, in, in our in our legislature, like maybe not. So, so yeah, it, it's just sort of not got this this cultural force anymore. That's why it's sort of not cool to be an atheist anymore. People like to be countercultural. And in mm -hmm. 2006, yeah. mm. being an atheist was edgy. It was cool. You could be the guy to say, well, actually, whereas now the, well, actually, technically, that's not true is coming from the, coming from the religious side, I think. Well, I would push back on this slightly in that we've, it's now very edgy to be atheist if you're going to criticize Islam. That's true. I mean, then, the then is it's not... incredibly edgy. And actually, let's be honest about it, downright dangerous. Yeah, well, for sure, yeah. Um, but I, I don't think that the edginess there is the atheism. It's Correct. not It's not saying God doesn't exist. It's saying Islam is bad for society, yes. which, is, which is a totally different claim, you know. Um, and, okay, actually, maybe that was still the case with Christianity in New Atheism. It was like in America, people would say that Christianity is bad for society. You know, evangelicals are ruining our society, and that was edgy, but it wasn't dangerous. Mm. It wasn't dangerous. I mean, sure, going through the Bible Belt on, on tour, like Christopher Hitchens, famously did a tour through the Bible Belt of America promoting God is not great. And like, you know, that, that's, that's kind of funny, you know, how dangerous. I mean, sure, maybe he could have got shot or something, fine. But you can't really imagine him doing the same thing through the Muslim world. I mean, he's, he'd been to the Muslim world mm. as, a, as a political reporter, but he didn't do a book tour, God is not great. I mean, it's just, it's a sort of, it's a different category, but it's also a different category of edginess. That's not yeah. new atheism anymore. That's yeah. sort of, um, you know, that's, that's, that's its own breed of, of, of politic and philosophy. And looking at the younger generation, do you think they're suffering through a lack of spirituality or are they replacing it with something else? We've spoken about wokeism, but is there something else that's bubbling under the surface? Well, people are suffering from a lack of meaning. Um, meaning is, uh, pe pe people always ask about, about meaning and purpose. And, it, and, and there's that, that really 
tired joke about what meaning means, but it's not a joke. Like, what, 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 are, we, what are we talking about here? Like, it, it's such an intuitive question that people ask all the time. What's the meaning of life? What, what, what the hell are you looking for? Like, what do you mean by meaning? Mm -hmm. And I, I, the best I can come up with is something like a, a non-contingent reason to act. So like a reason to act or to be that isn't dependent on something else. Right, like in order to do anything, you need like a reason to do it. Like why, why, why are we sat here to film a conversation? But why are we filming a conversation? Well, to put it on YouTube. Mm -hmm. If we weren't going to put it on YouTube, we wouldn't be sat here with all these cameras. It would be ridiculous. You need the thing before it in order to justify why you've set the camera up, right? And so you can keep going back and back and back. And the meaning, the purpose of life in your life is, is the stopping point, mm -hmm. is the first thing. And bear in mind, some people say, well, I just don't have any any purpose. Probably they, they mean like no objective purpose that should be um, prescribed, but you must have something that is ultimately motivating you, otherwise you wouldn't be doing anything. And so what the, what the religious will often do is say that whatever that thing is, that's God. And so Peterson defines God as whatever's at the top of your value hierarchy. That's just his definition of divine. He says, you know, you're writing an essay. Why? To get a good grade. Why? To get a good job. Why? To provide for your family. Why? And, and if you keep going down, whatever you, you bottom out in is God. Now, the, the, the point that he makes, and I think the reason he then says, you know, famously, oh, you think you're an atheist, well, you don't act like one. You're not really an atheist kind of thing, is because he correctly identifies that everybody has to have the sumum bonum. Everybody has that first uh, motivating reason. So everyone's going to have one no matter what. And I think that the the sort of nihilism and confusion that people experience is that before they were told what it was. They were told, even if you don't recognize it, the thing motivating you is, is God. Um, whereas now it's unclear and people who are struggling with meaning, I think are sort of going on a journey of trying to discover what that thing is. And sometimes they find that they don't like it because if you're an atheist materialist, mm -hmm. you realize that ultimately the thing that's motivating me is my genetics and my crude bodily desires. And you can explain morality, the reason that morals exist is because of reciprocal altruism or because we share genes with each other and that's why it evolved. But ultimately you break it down. Well, what's the ultimate motivation? Well, because I've got genes inside me that are dictating that I do particular things. Mm. That is the sumum bonum. And we've, we've replaced, you know, the Imago Dei being made in the image of God, being created with a telos and a natural purpose, which is communion with the Almighty to you're an animal. And that's not a nice realization. And I think that's probably at the basis of people getting a little bit um, thirsty for something with a bit more narrative, let's say. Our partners, Give, Send, Go, are hosting thousands of crowdfunding campaigns in the US, UK, and around the world right now. There's a campaign on there right now where you can invest in a UK startup that aims to revive the traditional high street. Imagine a world where we're less reliant on the huge supermarket chains what if there was an easy way to spend our money with local, independent grocers, butchers, bakers, etc.? Instead of lining the pockets of faceless corporate behemoths built on cheap labor, monopolizing the market, and that have destroyed small businesses. Barrow uses AI tech to pick up your shopping from hundreds of independent stores in a single transaction when it's all delivered to you at the same time. Give, Send, Go have proved time and again that they uphold freedom of speech unlike the bigger crowdfunding sites. That's why we are proud to partner with them. They, like us, believe that with openness and honesty, we'll create more understanding and ultimately more harmony in the world. Starting a campaign on Give, Send, Go is easy and intuitive. Go to givesendgo.com today. That's givesendgo.com to start raising money for whatever's important to you. And now, back to the interview. I think as well, what people find is that when they start to do something which is more in service of others, which is, for example, have a family, or you see it in Alcoholics Anonymous, people who were once hopeless addicts, but now their mission in life is to help others and to help others who are suffering from addiction, they become a different human being, almost overnight as a result of that purpose and drive. Mm. And I think that's one of the things that we're lacking, which is what, what is your life's mission? What do you want to do? What do you want to achieve? Yes, you need, you need purpose. And that purpose, as I say, everybody has a purpose. But if you recognize that the purpose is something essentially trivial and something that's outside of your control, then I, I suppose the motivation starts to fade away, which is why God was a good one, because God 
you know, God being the same thing as love and the same thing as beauty mm. entails that you can do things like helping other people and you can say that it's in the service of God. Whereas now you have to sort of rationalize it as, yes, ultimately the reason I'm doing it is in the service of my own genes and my own self. Um, that just doesn't have the same sort of romance. Yeah, but you, that's because you don't have to stop at, the, 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 at that mm. particular point. So once you've got to the point where you go, well, I'm just, I'm here to reproduce. That's all I'm here. That's all my purpose that I have. Then you're free actually. And then you can create whatever purpose you want. The purpose can be to serve other people. Uh, you know, I've reproduced, right? Now my job is to raise my son so he can reproduce. Okay, cool. I'll do that. But in the meantime, I can create a show that other people will enjoy. I can give meaning to people by articulating things that they struggle to articulate. I can advocate on behalf of people who are not able to advocate on their own behalf. I can, do, I can uh, create a business with Francis in which other people work who otherwise wouldn't have a job that fulfilled them, right? I can mentor the young guys coming through. To, there are things, there is meaning you can create for yourself, even if the realization you have is the ultimate meaning is to reproduce your genes. I'm not sure that you can create your own meaning in a fundamental sense. I'm always suspicious of this concept. I think everything you've just said already presupposes an, an underlying value judgment. And I'll tell you why, right? Mm -hmm. So you say, well, I've decided that, you know, I'm going to have a child and raise that child. And I've just sort of created that. I've just decided. No, 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 no. I'm saying I have fulfilled my biological function. Oh, sure. And it's okay, so my biological separately. function to get him to adulthood so he can reproduce. Sure. So that's the biology aside. Sure. And also, at the same time, there is other areas of my life where I can create meaning, whether that's, you know, growing a garden or helping my neighbor, whatever it is that... Yeah, but, you know, supposing one person, let's say we can just choose our own meaning. We just create meaning in our lives. Okay, so one person decides to, to, to create meaning in their life by raising as much money as they can for Oxfam and lifting thousands of people out of poverty. Another person decides that their meaning in life is to, is to count the blades of grass in Hyde Park. They just want to count how many blades of grass there are. And sometimes, you know, someone comes along and, and, and mows the lawn and they have to start again. And that, that's, they, they just decide, and you say to them, well, what's meaningful about that? And they say, well, what do you mean? You just get to choose that it's meaningful. I've just decided that it is. Mm. You'd be committed to the view that both of those lives are as meaningful as each other. No, I didn't say that. They're not as meaningful but, as but each other. But how can they not be if, 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 there's, no, if there's no sort of uh, exterior like, prescription as to what meaning ought to be and you just get to create it for yourself? Mm. That, that's what I mean by the, the underlying value judgment, because if you want to say that that person's life is more meaningful than the other... But, but who said that that's what we're doing? The comparison was introduced by you for reasons that are... Well, is one, of the, is, is one of those lives more meaningful than the other, do you think? Um, you, or based on my own personal value set, yes, but it's sure. my value set. So, so, though, so that value set is already dictating what you would consider meaningful and not meaningful. For me. And, and for other people, because you're saying based on your value set, yes. that person's life is more, yeah, is but, more meaningful but, than another's. Again, we come back to this. I have no intention of going to that person and telling them this value set is not as of good course, as my value set. that's a separate set. question. A better example would be not counting blades of grass by becoming a serial killer. Yes, right? I, I was going to say that, that that's sort of the example. next step, right? Yeah. The question is really... Well, I'm not trying to judge whether that way of life is more meaningful or not. There's clearly some people in, in human history who were mass murderers, mm. Uh, who got a lot of meaning from it. I can mm. I can give you lots of names that we all know, right? However, the issue is, is their behavior acceptable to the rest of society as we reflect in our laws and customs, et cetera, right? Sure, but those are two separate questions, right? I mean, so somebody's life could be could be, could be be flooded with meaning, could be mm -hmm. the most meaningful life that anyone's ever lived, and yet, because it's really bad for the rest of us, we, we still sort of put them yeah. in prison, right? Yeah. Yeah. But their life is still much more meaningful than anybody else. Do you think yeah, Genghis Khan had more meaning than you? I think he probably did. Exactly, right? Right. But, the, like, what, what we, we commit ourselves to by saying that you can just create your own meaning is that however one decides to create their own meaning, as long as they feel that meaning, mm. their life just is meaningful. And, and, and that's fine. Maybe, right. that's, maybe that's what that's meaning what is. Saying. But it just, it just rings a little bit hollow to me when, 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 you start to, when you start to recognize that if somebody is just able to decide that spending their entire life counting blades of grass is meaningful, there you go. That's, that's the meaningful life. As long as they feel that it gives them meaning. It's just, that's the key point. It's creating... Meaning seems to be something like... Or, or purpose seems to be sort of... Um, something to do. It, it, it's, a, it's a reason to do something. So it's sort of a, a task to fulfill or an objective yes. to attain or to strive for. And so to create your own meaning is to create a task just for the sake of fulfilling the task. No, it's no. an expression of who you truly are. I don't know what that means. I know. Well, what, what, do you, what do you mean by that? 
the meaning that you choose to create mm -hmm. is a, an expression of who you truly are as a human being. Sure, yeah. But I mean, do, do, you, do you see what I'm saying when I, when I, I mean, that's why I like the word purpose. Yes. Because it, I think it more... The point is you are not creating it necessarily. You're not sitting down with a piece of paper. It's not an invention. It's an expression of who you already are. Mm. Well, mean, meaning is either something that you invent or that you discover for yourself. Right? Exactly. Mm. And I suppose the position of the atheist materialist has to be that it's something you invent. Because there's nowhere from which you can discover it. If there's nothing more than, you know, if there's, if there's nothing more to, to, to the mind than just human beings and, and, and biology, where, where else can an idea like that come from? It has to come from themselves. They have to invent it. Of course, if you're religious, you, you, can, you can discover the meaning that's, that's sort of embedded into your very creation. But if you don't have that, you have to invent your own meaning. And, and I, I don't know if you see what I'm saying here about this, this, this purpose task thing, right? Like if I, it's kind of like if you're, if you're bored, you know, like the, the if, if you're really bored, you might just sort of like knock over a glass of water so that you can go and mop it up just to give you something to do. And that's kind of what I feel like is going on with people creating their own purpose. Because mm -hmm. the pur purpose is to have a reason to do something. It's a, it's a reason, it's, a, it's something to strive for. It's I'm going to sound religious here, yeah. Alex. Right? And if you, you create will know, that for its own sake. When you find your purpose, yeah. you will know what I'm when talking When you create about. that for its own sake, I think that's what you're doing. Right? But also as well, I mean... But maybe, maybe you're also right. Yeah, maybe, you're, you're, it, it's, you're not creating it for the purpose of fulfilling yeah. it. But notice what you just said. You said when you find your own meaning. Did you say find? Yes. So, so now we're talking, if, if one day I find meaning, if I discover meaning, yes. then not only will I suddenly have a much more meaningful life, but yes. I'll also be rid of the conviction that we do create our own meaning because it'll be something that I've discovered that's yes. been set upon yeah, me. Yeah, because that's why I'm saying it's an expression of who you truly are. And I totally agree that if it is something you discover, if it's something that's set upon you from the outside, then that's, that's absolutely No, I didn't something. say that. I didn't say it's from the outside. I said it's an expression of who you already are inside. So it's something you discover about your own self. Correct. That's fine too. Yeah. And what that means is that you're discovering what you most fundamentally value. Yes. And that's fine, but some people will find that the thing they most fundamentally value is something that I think you would look upon and think is is bad or wrong Agreed, yeah. or immoral. Agreed. Um, but you wouldn't think that affects how meaningful their life no, is. No, but it clearly doesn't. There are people who advocate then for I th things I think we're in, in the public space that yeah. I think are abhorrent and wrong, but it clearly, their activism, quote unquote, gives them meaning and purpose. Yeah. I suppose people might intuitively want to say that, well, that, that it makes sense. Do you think it makes sense ever to say that while somebody feels like their life is really meaningful, it's actually not? Do you think that can ever be true? Well, people sometimes lie, but that's not, not the not, same not, no, thing. No, okay, discounting lying, right? But like if somebody, if somebody thinks their life is meaningful, can they be incorrect? Because the view that you're, you're putting forward here, and, and maybe it's true, means that they can't be incorrect. Um, I, I think that people sometimes will delude themselves about, they, they will do things that make them feel good and they will get confused and they will think, well, you know, advocate throwing soup on the Mona Lisa is right. the purpose of my life and my meaning is to go out there and advocate for climate change mm -hmm. awareness or whatever. And then they grow up and they realize maybe that wasn't the sure. purpose and meaning of the life. Mm -hmm. However, I do believe there is a meaning and a purpose to be discovered by that person at some point, and they may, in the right conditions, do that. So that's interesting. If they think that the meaning of their life is climate activism, and then one day they grow out of it, as yeah. you say, the question is, once they've grown out of it and they look back, would is it the case that their life was meaningful at the time? It was. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Well, obviously. Yeah. Then, then, then fine. But I, I think, um, I suppose the objection that I'm driving at is that it just seems to make it all a bit arbitrary. And me meaning is supposed to be the big foundational human thing. It's what makes us human. You know, it's 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 having that reason to get out of bed in the morning. It's it's having a, a reason to act. And if that grand thing is reduced to something as arbitrary as just like you know, whatever you sort of happen to want, that's not what I said yeah. though. Well, I didn't it, say it's whatever you happen to want. What it, it's discovering your most fundamental value. Yes, which is whatever you happen to. Want, no, most it's... fundamentally. To value <laughs> no, something is no. because want is for me rooted in desire. Yes. Yeah. Want is I desire this. Is, is value not no, rooted in desire? No, no, no. Value to me is something completely different. Value to me is what is important to you and the way that you see the world and the way that you move within the world. It's important to you, right? Like... Yes. But it's but a, a desire is is something that I don't think is of importance. I can desire something, but it's not actually of importance. 
I don't think you can desire something that you don't value. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Well, I disagree. You I can desire to buy, you can desire material possessions. They're not actually of importance. You may believe yeah. they are of importance, but they're actually not. I know what you mean. Uh, this is where I think it gets a bit complicated because mm. I think that when you desire a material object, you don't desire the material object. You desire the joy that you're promised from the material object. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when you buy the material object and it turns out not to be what you wanted, it's not that you desired the material object and you were wrong. It's that you desired the joy and you didn't get it. So you still, you, you like, I, when I say you can't desire something you don't value, mm -hmm. there seem to be really obvious counterexamples. You know, I can, I can desire material goods, but actually I don't value them. The thing is, what you really desire from that material good is joy, and you do value the joy. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. But, I, so I'll use an example for, like, let's say a comedian or somebody who is in the performing arts. They say they desire success. Mm. But you talk to enough successful people, like, you know, comedians, whoever it is, and they will actually say to you, once they've reached a certain level, that actually the adulation is empty. The true joy comes in the creating. Yeah. And the creating, the reason that they love it so much is because it's an expression of who they are. Yeah. Is it art, is it, and I'm not going to sound religious when I say this, but art is an expression of the soul. Yeah. Okay. And so that's where the joy comes from. It doesn't come from a million Twitter followers. It doesn't come from playing out huge venues. It comes from doing what you love and making a connection with another person. Yeah, but notice that the thing that's desired there is the joy. Yes. So like, like you say, somebody desires success. Well, if we're going to be pedantic about it, which I think we have to be when we're having this kind of, um, this kind of discussion about essentially definitions, right? You don't, you don't desire the, let's say, success or the, or the fame or the, or the audience. What you desire, strictly speaking, is the, it's the sort of positive mental state, the joy, as you put mm -hmm. it, that comes from having that, right? If I told you, for example, if somebody said, oh, I really, I really desire uh, to, to, to play in front of uh, 5,000 people. And I said, well, look, how about this? I, I can grant this to you, but I will just make it so I'll go into your brain chemistry and make it so that you hate it. You, I, I promise you that you can do it, but you will hate it. You'll have a terrible time. You'll be in pain. You'll be embarrassed. You'll, you'll hate the whole experience. You'd probably be like, well, actually, I don't want to do that. Because you didn't desire to be in front of 5,000 people, you desired this joy and you're using the phrase, you know, selling out a venue as a proxy for that thing that you desire, right? And, and so the thing that's actually desired in and of itself is that thing which you value, which is joy. And that's why I think that desire and value are essentially the same thing. Thus, when you say that finding meaning is about essentially discovering what your fundamental value is, it's about discovering what your fundamental desire is. And that seems arbitrary to me. But it's also about the expression of the self. Right. That's what it goes down. So for instance, I know a comedian, he's very good, he's very skillful, he's built this huge online following, he's now achieving his dream. I know for a fact that he doesn't particularly like his audience, his material isn't actually honest to what he thinks and believes, he's essentially trapped now, and that is a very, very quick way to make yourself miserable because you're living a life and you're producing an art that is completely inauthentic to who you are. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, I, 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 I know what you mean, right? So, so the, I, I suppose the, the desire element there mm. is, this, is this desire to express yourself. But I, I, I never... But that's not a desire. This is the difference. Yeah. I think, and to be honest, I, th I think we may be getting sort of lost in the weeds here. And I'm not, I'm not entirely sure exactly what it is that we're, we're, we're arguing about. Mm. Because, but but this, is the, this is the problem with when you start talking about meaning and purpose and spirituality and this kind of thing, you end up watching these discussions and, 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 and people think, hey, what, what, what are you even talking about anymore? Mm -hmm. We were talking about like, you know, whether desire is intricately linked to value. Like, okay, that's an interesting conversation, but it sounds like something out of a bloody platonic dialogue or something. You know what I mean? It, it, well, it's... that's what I was about to say. Expression of your true self is a lot like love. It can only be experienced. It can't be explained. Like mm -hmm. we could sit here and have this exact same conversation that we've just had about the word meaning or the word purpose about the word love. There is no way to communicate it through language. There isn't. That's that's true. There, are, there are other many. than it's uh, irrational brain chemistry that makes you feel certain feelings. What those feelings are, you cannot possibly explain. Right. That's true. Yes. So, what I'm trying to tell you is the 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 thing we're talking about in terms of meaning and purpose is not something that actually can be communicated through words to somebody who hasn't yet experienced it. 
I, th- I can I can understand that. I, yeah. I I understand that there are things in the world which can only be known through experience. Yes, let's yeah. say. Yes, and um, I suppose I think uh, a good example of this is probably parenthood. Mm-hmm. Um, I I I can sort of take a guess at what it's like to sort of have a kid and really care about your kid and and find meaning in bringing them up. But I I imagine that it's like you just don't even come close to getting it no. until you have a kid of your own, right? No. Mm. And maybe there's something like that going on. That that's that's totally that's possible. it. Yeah. But yet, if you ask me to define, you know, what does it mean to have a child, or what does it mean to you know value their upbringing, I think I could still take a pretty good crack at at, at saying what that is. And I, I do think that this definition of meaning, if not essentially being linked to desire and and uh, and 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 value, but value being desire, I don't know what meaning is, in other words. But if you, if you if you have a better definition or or can land on one then 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 you let me know I suppose. All right. If you're watching this, you need to get pregnant by Alex so you can have a child and realize everything you just said doesn't make sense. Anyway, Alex, it's been great having yeah. you back. Yeah, it's um it's it's, it's always a joy. I, I hope it's not gotten a bit too um a bit a bit too sort of wordy and and, and abstract no. and Look, at least you yeah. didn't walk out like Peter Hitchens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, actually, you know, if if you're going to make this whole interview about meaning and value then good luck. <laughs> but <laughs> frankly, I'm sick of the subject and I'm sick to death of the people who promote it. Yeah. And that's when, and that, and that's when I saw it. Just yeah. don't rip the microphone as you leave. Um, before we go over to our local supporters who get to ask questions to uh, Alex, our final question is always the same. And you've, you've actually mentioned it at the start, ruining the reveal, which is what's the one thing we're not talking about as a society that we really should be? Okay, well, so there's, there's that, but, but because I'll, you know, I want to give you something else. Um, I think... The extent to which emotions are at play in what we think is rational decision making. Everybody recognizes this to some degree. Everybody recognizes that, oh, you're, you're actually you know, being more emotional than you realize. But I, I mean, like, really specifically. I, I recently spoke to Robert Sapolsky. I don't know if you've had him on the show. He just wrote a book about uh, why there's no free will, which, um, which I agree with. I don't think there is. And as part of discussing that, he talked about this so-called hungry judge phenomenon. I don't know if you've come across this. There was this, this, this large-scale study done about um, uh, parole boards. And they were trying to figure out what's the biggest predictive factor as to whether a judge grants parole or not. And they found that the biggest predictive factor is how long it had been since the judge had eaten a meal. Mm-hmm. Now, that's really, that's really like cool and funny and like, oh, what an interesting anecdote. And people go to prison or get their freedom based on whether or not a judge is hungry. And I think, it's my contention, that this happens all the time, mm-hmm. that we are essentially emotive creatures, that things we think are plain, simple, propositional truths are not. People recognize this to some degree. Oh, I was hangry. Oh, you need to sleep mm-hmm. on it. They recognize that sometimes, you know, the, 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 the way that your emotive status can affect how you're reasoning. I, I think it's like, emotion through and through. I think so much of what we think is emotion, moralizing is emotion. Ethics is expression of emotion. Even like, you know, uh, when, when you consider your, your basic philosophical premises, I've, I've sometimes argued in the past that we can emotivize all of philosophy. I mean, why can't P be true and false at the same time? Why is the law of non-contradiction, fundamental logical law, why does it hold? Well, because when you try to consider P being true and false at the same time, your brain just goes, no, just goes, boo, just goes, I don't like it. Mm. I, I think that so much of our thinking is emotive and um, there's nothing we can do about that. People bring it up to say, well, why don't we fix it? You know, the hungry judge phenomenon, if, if, we, uh, if we all recognize that, then we can, we can start trying to make judges act in accordance with reason and said, no, we can't. It's not going to go away, but we have to be aware of it so that we can mitigate the fact of its inevitability. It's a great answer. There's a lot I disagree with and find out what that is on Locals. Cosmic Skeptic, as far as I've seen, you have avoided the trans debate. Hmm. What are your views on the whole situation? 